Hello, I'm Douglas Jacoby, and it's an honor for me to visit you in Honolulu and to speak on the topic of Holy Week, and particularly what scripture and Christian tradition can teach us. I bring you warm greetings from Scotland, where my wife and I are living for uh, the next five years or so. And uh, I'm here teaching in the Athens Institute Pacific. Let's get right into the message. If you're new to Christianity, or you have an interest in church history, uh, you might like to know that Lent, that period where people give up things, usually starts on Ash Wednesday, Ash Wednesday when people in some traditional churches put ash on their forehead, and that lasts about 80 days. And then there's Holy Week, and that begins with Palm Sunday and ends, or you could say it's the eighth day, uh, on Easter Sunday. And this is where I want to focus in this message. Palm Sunday is the occasion of Jesus' triumphal entry. Many Jews might have expected the Messiah to arrive on a horse. Interestingly, I was reading some of the ancient Jewish sources, and one of the rabbis said that if God is pleased with us, the Messiah will come on the clouds of heaven. If he's displeased with us, he'll come riding on a donkey. <laughs> Interestingly, as prophesied in Zechariah 9.9, Jesus came riding on a donkey. Palm Sunday, assuming that the year 30 is the year of Jesus' death, would have fallen on the 2nd of April. Now, I'll back up for a moment. You may say, how do you know what year it was? Well, it has to do with where Passover falls and the years in which Jesus was alive. There are really only two years that could work. That's the year 33 and the year 30. But most New Testament scholars believe the year 30 was correct. And so here we have the triumphal entry. And Jesus, of course, looks around the temple courts and eventually sends a message to the establishment by kicking over the tables of the money changers. He's uh, targeting the corruption of the establishment. He continues to teach that week. And then we come to the Last Supper, what in traditional churches is sometimes called Monday Thursday. And he has the Last Supper with his disciples. He's arrested. Then they walk across the Kildren Valley to the Garden of Gethsemane. He prays. He's arrested. He's taken back across the garden up to uh, Zion area to the house of Caiaphas, where he's imprisoned. Uh, he's put the house of Caiaphas, actually the lower part has survived, and it had a prison and even a dungeon underneath the prison. Amazing what these bigwigs did. There's a meeting of many of the Jewish leaders. It's not the full Sanhedrin, which is more than 70 people. It's a nighttime informal in inquiry, but they come together and they condemn him. He's delivered the next day, Good Friday, to Pontius Pilate. And Pilate even sends him to Herod, and he's sent back, and then he's crucified. The next day, I will simply call it Dark Saturday. There's no information except for the posting of the guard. But this is when Jesus descended to the dead, to Hades, and, and proclaimed the message. And then the next day, which is technically the day after Passion Week, but I'm putting these eight days all together, is Easter Sunday, the day of the resurrection and the first appearances. If you're new to Christianity, you will understand that for many churches, this is very significant. In the early church, Christmas was not observed. Christmas may be some people observed in the third century, but it's not really to the fourth century that that's a big thing. But Easter was observed from the very beginning. And the idea is that the flow of the church year, the church calendar year, somehow matches the flow of events in Jesus's life. And I think there can be good in that. The Passion Week, of course, focuses on the crucifixion. And I want to talk first about the seven last sayings of Christ on the cross. In the second part of this message, I want to talk about a number of surprises surrounding Easter. So we're focusing now on the Friday and on the Sunday. Now, we could look at seven last sayings of Christ before the cross. I've put together these, for example, this very night you will deny me three times. And Simon, are you asleep? Or maybe daughters of Jerusalem, don't weep for me. Weep for yourselves and your children. But we're not looking at the sayings before the cross. We're going to look at the sayings on the cross. And just a thought about the cross. In the Greek alphabet, which you're looking at here, it almost looks like an optical chart. Can you see the T? It's inside the circle. That's a Greek letter, tau. 
Jesus, it seems, was crucified on a Tau cross. And this is mentioned in other ancient Christian documents. That is, the cross uh, was simply the letter T, not with something sticking up, although they did put on top of the cross a sign indicating the crime of the prisoner. Crucifixion in the Roman world was typically something for slaves or the disenfranchised. Roman citizens would not be crucified unless they committed treason. It was a very painful way to die and dragged on normally for days. We know from archeological remains of crucified people that their ankles were nailed to the cross. There are also a number of depictions that have survived. This is actually from the second century. This is from Rome. Now it may be very hard to read the graffito. So let me make it easier, okay? <laughs> Maybe you say it's still hard. All right, what it's, here you have on the cross, you'll notice it's a Tau cross, just like this, not like that. Not the one you would do in your dreams. I used to have dreams about vampires and I would go that, do that to keep them away, but it never worked. It's a Tau cross. And what's crucified there is a donkey or a donkey man. This is not a Christian graffito. This is the kind of graffiti that's anti-Christian. And you can see the worshiper there, and it says, Alexamonos Sebete Don the own. Alexamonos is the man. He worships his God, who's a crucified jackass. This is not pro-Christian propaganda. It's anti-Christian, but it shows us, for one, they worship Christ as God. For two, the that this cross was indeed a shameful thing, a scandal. Paul says in 1 Corinthians that the cross is foolishness to Greeks and a stumbling block to the Jews. And yet it's the very heart of Christianity because this is where God deals with our sins. And this is significant. So let's talk about the seven last sayings of Christ on the cross. The first, and these are found in uh, all the gospels. So uh, I'm doing my best to put them in the right order. And understanding that when Jesus was actually crucified, it would be hard for him to speak at length. He could say a sentence. He could say a few words, but the pain and the difficulty of breathing while being crucified would mean that uh, he was unable. The first, and to me, maybe the most amazing of all, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Who's he referring to? The Romans who are crucifying him, who have been mocking him? Or the high priest and his father-in-law who ran the corrupt system? Do they not know what they were doing? Or you and me, whose sins ultimately and directly put Jesus on the cross? We don't know what we're doing? I mean, if, if it had been me, I would never would have prayed like that. I might have said, Father, forgive them. I might even have said, forgive them, for they know exactly what they're doing. They're going to need your forgiveness. But Jesus is gracious in this prayer. And so Luke 23, 34, for a long time, has been a very powerful passage to me. Because sometimes, admit it, we want people to suffer. We want them to be taught a lesson. And if we're insulted or treated badly, we want to get back. But that's not what Jesus did. He didn't curse. He didn't unfriend those who let him down. He replied to violence with love, just as he said, we must do, always loving our enemies and never hurting them. The second saying, and this is also from Luke's gospel, just a few verses later, Jesus was crucified with two thieves, or one of them, uh, the word that's used suggests that he was a revolutionary. He'd been involved in a riot, and uh, this guy prays for forgiveness. The other thief does it. He's angry and bitter, but one of the thieves, to him, Jesus says, truly, today you will be with me in paradise. Paradise is the part of the underworld in early Christian thought and in the Bible. The dead are in the underworld. It's not under the earth any more than heaven is above the earth, literally. But the underworld was called Sheol in Hebrew. In the Greek New Testament, it's called Hades. We say Hades. Hades is not hell, although a lot of people are confused about that. And paradise is the good part of Hades. It's where the saved are waiting until the judgment day when they'll go to heaven. Today, you'll be with me in paradise. Uh, so much to say here, but notice one thief took full responsibility, the other didn't. God gives a last minute reprieve. It's an amazing passage. Some people are irritated by this passage. They say, 
How come he wasn't baptized? You know, this just makes it difficult for me to proclaim the gospel. Well, the passage is not about baptism. Baptism is a participation in Jesus' death and resurrection. That was impossible until he had died and resurrected. It's not, this guy died as a last minute convert or reconvert to Judaism, a faithful Jew. But notice what the passage tells us about God. He's willing to forgive, even at the last minute, if we're sincere. Let's not write people off. The third saying, and here he speaks to Mary, to his mother. Woman, behold your son. And while he says this, then he looks at the apostle John. Actually, it just says the disciple Jesus loved. Woman, behold your son. And then uh, son, behold your mother. And that's in John 19. Well, who's standing around the cross here? It's not the 12, only the beloved disciple and Jesus' aunt, and Mary Magdalene. And with the first three sayings, Jesus cares about others, despite his own pain. So he's focused on those who are hurting him, he's focused on the penitent thief, and now he's focused on his mother, despite his pain. If you're like me, when you're in pain, physical or emotional pain or mental pain, it's not like the first thing I want to do is be a blessing to others. I'm doing well if I could just be quiet and not say something negative. And here's Jesus just so giving. The fourth saying on the, and this is in, not in English, unfortunately, but you know, Jesus spoke Aramaic. And here we have in Aramaic or Hebrew, depends on which gospel, Eli Ale Lema Sabachthani. And Eli means my God, and Sabachthan E is forsaken me, and Lema is why. And he's actually quoting from Psalm 22. Psalm 22 is sometimes called the crucifixion psalm. It's not a prayer of abandonment, like, God, you've left me, and I'm, you know, I'm your enemy, and there's no hope. It's actually a psalm of confidence. It begins with those words, why have you forsaken me? And then it recites the hardships that the innocent crucified man is going through, but it ends with confidence. In verse 22, which is actually quoted in Hebrews in the New Testament, he expresses his conviction that he will be restored, uh, and he'll worship among his brothers again. So it's the perfect scripture for this situation because it embraces the pain and the victory. Now, people listening thought he was calling Elijah because Eliahu sounds a bit like Eli Eli Lama Sabachthani, but he's not calling Elijah. He's speaking to God. He's praying. And this tells me to trust in God even when he feels absent. And sometimes we don't see God. Uh, I'll be in Mexico next week, and I'll be recording a message on Esther, and it's called Esther, God Behind the Scenes. True. The book of Esther never mentions the word God, but also true. You can see the hand of God in every chapter of Esther. He's there even if we don't see him, even if he feels absent. In fact, sometimes when he feels absent, these are the times where we have the greatest opportunities to grow in faith. Saying number five, I thirst. And I'm sure he was dehydrated. He's open about the needs and people provide him a drink. The one who provides living water to quench our deep thirst himself thirsts. And this is a fulfillment of Psalm 69, if you want to go further. Then it is finished. In the Greek New Testament, tetelestai. It is finished, the work of salvation. Notice the theme of time and progress in John starting in chapter two, all the way to this verse. And we, I won't read those passages, but there are a lot of them. And you can see that Jesus had a sense of timing, of fulfillment. He was on the way, a particular objective. It is finished means that he has provided salvation. We don't save ourselves. Christianity is not a religion to simply improve you and me. If you're attracted to Christianity because you think you could become better or maybe earn more money, this is not the religion for you. Find a motivational speaker. Find a self-improvement course. Christianity is a religion of suffering. We'll be called to suffer because that's the price of loving others, just as Jesus loved us. I guess the question is, am I seeking salvation? Am I seeking rescue outside of Christ? Or even by self-rescue? Like, I'm, I, I'm good, thank you. I'll save myself. That's a fool's errand. It'll never happen. And then the last saying on the cross, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And here again, he's quoting the psalm, Psalm 31. 
And we can see also parallels between Jesus's death and words here, and those of the first Christian martyr, Stephen, in Acts chapter 7. And he quotes from the Psalms. And again, we're to trust God, not people. And in our pain, in our confusion, loneliness, disappointment, and despair, to entrust ourselves to God. These are powerful words. Now, we could add one more saying, but it's not a saying on the cross, unless by on you mean above. And here you can see it says, uh, it says, Yeshua Hanatsri uh, uh, Wamelech Hayudim. In Greek, underneath that, Jesus of Nazareo, so Basileus ton Judaion. And in Latin, the language of Imperial Rome, Jesus Nazarenus or Rex Judaiorum. It all says the same thing Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. And that was the saying that was above the cross. No, we could go further. We could do a sermon on seven sayings after the cross. What are you talking about on the road? Jesus playfully asked. Or, woman, why are you weeping? Or, put your finger here and see my hands. And maybe one day I'll put together some sermons from these seven things before the cross and the seven things after the cross. But those are my thoughts about the Friday. Let's give some application before we talk about Easter. When we're in pain, let's not give up on God. Pray. Don't push others away. Be open. And don't blame others when they don't meet our needs just because we're frustrated. Easier said than done. Believe me. The Lord will meet our needs, so let's trust him and place our life, commit our spirit to him. Drawing confidence and perspective from the scriptures, God's message to us, and allow God to work in our lives in his time. Be patient. We've talked about the Good Friday. Saturday, the silent Saturday or dark Saturday, is followed by the resurrection. The stone is rolled away. Jesus has been resurrected. This year, that's April 17th. I was asked to do this message because we're leading up to that time. It's April, Easter is on the way. And I think your leaders wisely wanted you to have some context to understand, well, what is this about Lent or Good Friday or Palm Sunday and so forth? So we've been looking at the Friday. Now we're looking at Easter Sunday, which if Jesus died in the year 30, fell on April 9th. So he dies. He's buried, he's resurrected, and there are a number of surprises. And I hope you'll keep these in mind. I think some of them may be new to you. Keep these in mind over the next couple of weeks as Easter approaches. The first is that, as I mentioned, this has always been the most important Christian holiday, uh, not Christmas. And I think in Europe, Easter is the big deal. Probably in America, it's more Christmas, maybe because of all the toys and commercialism. It's actually called Passover in many languages. Uh, uh, Hebrew, it's Pesach. That's the word for Passover. But in Greek, it's Pascha. In, in the early church, they simply called it Passover because it happened about that same time. And so if we want to understand Easter, we should try to understand Passover. Jesus is the only one who's been resurrected from the dead. Now, you might say, what about Lazarus? It wasn't a full resurrection. Yes, he was brought back to life, but it's not a full, he was raised, but not in the sense that Jesus was. What about the people in the Old Testament? There are a number of people raised from the dead and the New Testament. Yes, but resurrection in the New Testament means we have a resurrection body. See, the Jews expected that the dead would be raised, but that was when the Messiah came at the end of time. What surprised them is that before the end of time, firstly, the Messiah died. They weren't counting on that. They should have because it's in the Bible. But then that he was resurrected ahead of everybody else. So the New Testament says that Jesus is the first fruits of the resurrection. He had a resurrection body. He could walk through a solid door. He could change his appearance. Uh, he had a, a body, but it was a resurrection body. And no one else had that. Everyone else raised would die again. So that's the first actual resurrection. And the second resurrection will be at the judgment day. So the other reanimations don't count because there's no resurrection body. And by the way, we're still mortal before the general resurrection. That means when we're all raised from the dead, we're still mortal, but we will be clothed with immortality. And that's a gift God gives to those who follow Christ. Here's a surprise for me, uh, something I noticed well, fairly recently, maybe 10 years ago, 
that the tomb was unguarded for the first day. And this actually helps me to trust the Bible. Here's why. Matthew 27 is where we read that some of the Jewish leaders say, this guy talked about being raised. Let's post a guard, you know, so no nonsense happens. But in Matthew, that takes place on Saturday. Now, if the early Christians were just making up the story about the cross and the resurrection, surely they would have had the guard posted on Friday so that it was obvious that no one overcame the Roman guard later. But it says it's on Saturday. I would have put it on Friday for obvious reasons, but the Bible simply tells it as it is. Next, the resurrection did not end the ministry of Jesus. He doesn't ascend to heaven on the evening of Easter. Now, if you read Luke 24 quickly, you might conclude that, because Luke 24, he rises from the dead, and at the end of the chapter, he's at Bethany on the Mount of Olives, and he ascends to heaven. Great. But Luke 25, which is Acts chapter 1, says that actually for another 40 days, he kept instructing his disciples. So Luke 24, it's all telescoped together, but in Luke 25, which is really Acts chapter 1, it's the same author. Uh, the, we see he's around for quite a while because his training isn't quite done. So it's necessary for Christ to ascend and to sit on the throne and then send the Spirit. All this has to happen. The, this is all part of the gospel. The gospel is not the death and resurrection of Jesus. That's part of it. The gospel has to do with his incarnation as human, his life, his ministry, death, burial, resurrection, the appearances, the ascension, giving the Spirit, and his return in glory, and the new Jerusalem. All of this is part of the gospel, and the gospel is certainly not repent and get baptized. That's the response to the gospel. So it's necessary for Christ to go back to heaven and then send the Spirit. Now, I know Easter has a pagan background, at least with a lot of our customs. I've got some uh, a bag of Easter eggs over here. I can't quite reach it. I'd go off camera. And of course, that's not what Easter is. It's not about bunnies and chocolate. And yet there is an historical core that's very serious. The church proclaims victory over death. It's not proclaiming sexual fertility like the Babylonians or many of the Europeans in the Middle Ages. Easter itself is a good thing. And last one, and this may be significant to you if you're just investigating Christianity, is that nearly all scholars, Christian or Jewish or atheist, nearly all scholars accept at least three things about Jesus. Well, four things, that he existed, okay, that he was crucified, that for some reason the tomb was empty, and his early followers believed he had been raised from the dead. This is something scholars, the vast majority, accept. I'm not saying that they're Christians or they believe he rose from the dead, but they say, yes, he was crucified, the tomb's empty, and the early church clearly believed he had risen from the dead. And I would ask you, what is the best explanation of those three facts? Is it that his demoralized followers somehow rebounded and made up the story of his resurrection? Or is it that the things that Jesus promised actually happened? He had predicted he would be killed by the establishment, and he predicted he would come back from the dead. To me, that makes a lot of sense. And that's made sense to me in my life for my first 45 years as a Christian I hope that'll make sense to you as well. You may be skeptical about this, like Thomas, the evening of, uh, well, this is the, the evening of the resurrection, the disciples are together, but Thomas is absent. A week later, his disciples are there, and Jesus shows up and stands among them and says, peace be with you, which uh, must have been quite unnerving as he walks right through the door, right through the door. Thomas had said, that he wanted to believe, but he really couldn't fake it. And that's important. Some art shows Thomas putting his finger into Jesus' side. Gospel of John doesn't say that Thomas put his finger into the side, only that he was invited to do so. Apparently, the invitation was enough, and Thomas falls down and worships Jesus as Lord and God. And this shows us that someone who's got questions, who's got doubt, and doubt is in the Bible. Sometimes it's a good thing, sometimes it's a bad thing. But it's something we work through. But it's okay, because Jesus allows Thomas the space he needs to come to faith. The Lord understands your need and my need for reassurance. Sometimes we need evidence. But faith is something we have some control over. It's not just a feeling. 
It's a response to evidence, which we discover. Faith is also relational. It's a trusting relationship. And some people don't want to believe because they simply don't want to make time for the Lord. And let's be real. We're all Thomas from time to time. Thomas falls down, my Lord and my God, he accepts Jesus as God. And that's quite a, a statement when in the Roman Empire, the only one you'd said is Lord and God is the emperor. You're making a political statement and you're risking your life. But this is the key to flourishing. It's realizing exactly who Jesus is. Thomas is bold and early. And I think reliable tradition says that he traveled to India a couple decades later and he preached the gospel and he was martyred there. John's gospel has, in, near the end, Jesus saying, have you believed because you've seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. So even though we may not see the miracles today, we can read about them. We could read about them. And even though we've not seen him, as Peter puts it, we're filled with a glorious and inexpressible joy. These thoughts about Good Friday, Easter Sunday, and even some lingering doubt that can be overcome, and God understands that need, form the backdrop for communion as we take the bread and the wine together. Thank you. God bless. Thank you so much for joining us for service today. Remember to like, comment, share, and subscribe, and follow us on Instagram and Facebook. Have a great rest of your day. Bye.